I'd like to welcome our next speaker, Dr. John Began. John is a member of Jennifer Phillips Kremen's lab at the University of Pennsylvania. The Kremen's lab investigates the epigenetic mechanisms regulating development and function of the mammalian central nervous system to discover how genome architecture controls genome function. We're extremely pleased to have you here today, John. Welcome. Thanks very much. Um, please let me know if you can hear me and, and see my slides okay. Um, and yeah, so I, I'm John Began. I'm a, a recent graduate of the Crummins Lab at UPenn and um, it, my PI Jennifer couldn't be here today, but I'm, I'm thrilled to, to take her place and really honored to be um, amongst such distinguished speakers. So, so thank you again. Um, and yeah, I'm, I'm thrilled to present today a story we've been working on for the past few years and it is set to, to actually come out public next week. Um, so be on the lookout for that. And really, generally speaking, our lab is, is captivated by the complexity of neural connections, how they are specifically wired, and then how the, the connections are maintained, strengthened, and plastic throughout the lifetime of an individual. And the, the overarching question that drives our research is how genetic mutations and epigenetic modifications due to the environment will govern synaptic plasticity in both healthy mammalian brain activities as well as neurological disorders. And of course, I wouldn't be speaking today if we didn't particularly focus on the regulatory role 3D genome folding plays during these processes. And so in particular today, I'll be focusing on one feature of neural developmental biology, and that's how neurons alter their behavior and functional output in response to input signals, i.e. how neurons rewire during development. And so here we're looking at the, the visual cortex of a mouse responding to different visual cues, and each flash of light is a neuron firing an electrical impulse. And on the surface, this is amazing, but why is this phenomenon interesting as it relates to chromatin folding? And that, that's because as we were digging through some seminal literature, we keep coming across observations like this one. So here we're looking at electron microscopy, microscopy images that show upon neuronal depolarization or neuronal activation, that global chromatin folding undergoes marked changes in compaction that gets stronger during depolarization or as depolarization is sustained, and then can recover upon removal of the stimulus. But of course, this kind of approach doesn't give us genomic location information, so we wanted to understand how genome topology connecting specific distal regulatory elements is reconfigured during neuronal activation, and that would be using C technologies like what have been discussed uh, by the previous speakers. And we believe that this, this approach, this uh, goal of identifying genomic locations, specific genomic locations that rearrange during neuronal activation may be important because of the potential that there may be a, this may be a regulatory force overseeing activity response gene expression in neurons. And, and so by this, I mean um, when a neuron undergoes one of those depolarization events in response to an external stimulus, calcium ions flow into the cell body through voltage-gated channels that triggers a signaling cascade um, that makes its way to the nucleus. And this leads to the upregulation of a set of genes I'll be referring to as immediate early genes, or IEGs, such as FOS and ARC. And this really occurs on the time scale of seconds to minutes. It's incredibly rapid. And some of these genes, like ARC, go on to encode proteins that can then go and alter the synaptic properties of the neuron, whereas others, like FOS, encode transcription factors that drive the upregulation of a second set of genes which I'll refer to as secondary response genes, or SRGs, such as BDNF. And this uh, upregulation of BDNF, or these secondary response genes, occurs really on the time scale of, of minutes to hours. It's much slower in comparison to, to IEG expression. And then, of course, these genes like BDNF include proteins that can go back to alter the functional properties of these neural networks. And hey, so, John, sorry, sorry to interrupt real quick. This is Joe. Sure. It's a little bit choppy. I don't know if you can do anything to um, affect the connection. It's still okay. um, we can. It's still comprehensible, but just a little choppy. Just FYI. Okay, I'll just slow down a bit, um, and hopefully, I, uh, hopefully, it, it catches up. Sorry about that. Um, no problem. So, so this activity-dependent gene expression regulates how synapses form and degrade and function, which is especially critical during those early developmental years as our brains are shaped by our environmental stimuli. But activity-dependent gene expression continues to be critical for how we store memories and process thoughts well into adulthood. And so my PI Jennifer and me but were really fascinated by all of this and anchored on three basic questions at the start of our, our work. First, 
our genome folding patterns altered upon the stimulation of neural activity when we use C-based approaches like high c compared to those electron microscopy images we were looking at earlier. Second, are there different long-range 3D epigenetic mechanisms uh, that, that regulate IEGs, those rapid response genes, compared to those much slowly responsed SRGs? And finally, what is the, the timing of loop formation if there are any dynamic loops? And how does that relate to the functionality of those loops, i.e., how does that relate to the expression of the genes at the base of those loops? And so we set out to answer these questions using um, chromosome confirmation capture carbon copy, or 5C. And much like capture C, that selects specific regions of the genome uh, with which, uh, across which we can analyze global chromatin folding patterns. And so we created these high resolution maps of genome folding in murine cortical neurons after inhibition and induction of neuronal activity. And again, this is just across a select subset of the genome. So we did this surrounding key immediate early genes and key secondary response genes that we were interested in, as well as other synaptic proteins that were not as dynamically expressed across, um, across neural activity. And so our first pass impression from these maps is that genome folding at a global scale is largely unchanged upon alterations in neural, neural activity. So here we're talking about those higher levels of the genome folding hierarchy. At uh, the TAD level, at the compartment level, we see very little change across these maps. Um, and it, it's important to, at this point to highlight that this is kind of what we expected to find, to be honest, that most of the previous literature on dynamic genome architecture, including our own work, was focused on very large scale changes in cell state taking place across several days. And so here, you know, we're just looking at changes in neuronal activity of post-mitotic neurons on the time scale of minutes to hours. And so we, we knew, um, we kind of came in expecting not to see these huge scale changes, and we knew we wanted to focus on specific punctate looping interactions. But it, it was possible and even probable to us that loops were unimportant here, or at least not dynamic. And, and so we came up with three possible models for what we would find uh, that we could then test. So first, uh, the first hypothesis, this nearest enhancer hypothesis, is that loops really were perhaps unimportant here, that only activity-induced enhancers, this, this blue orb here, um, that were close enough to genes such that they did not require long-range looping interactions, that only these enhancers actually drove activity response and response gene expression. Um, second, and kind of my, my personal favorite uh, hypothesis was that perhaps loops um, were important, but invariant. So the same loops existed in inactive neurons as they did in active neurons, and they actually poise these activity-induced enhancers near their target genes so that when the neuron becomes active, these enhancers can turn on and rapidly upregulate the target gene with the need to form new loops. And finally, we were open to the, to the hypothesis that both enhancers and loops would form together as neurons become active. And so first we wanted to test the validity of this nearest enhancer model. And we did that by building three simple linear regression models. And so in, in each of these that I'll show, we're using the H3K27 acetyl chip fold change signal at different regulatory regions as the explanatory variable in these linear regression models to predict the response variable of, of gene expression. So here, uh, this first model, this, this positive control, as it were, um, I'm showing using promoter acetylation fold change as the predictor of gene expression fold change. And like I say, this is kind of our positive control because we really expected and indeed saw a strong positive correlation between the two. And, and this, this simple model explained roughly 50% of the variance in our transcription data on its own. And then we tested the relative contribution of different enhancer elements by adding them as a second explanatory variable term in these linear regression models. So here, on top of this promoter term, we're adding a second term that contains the acetylation fold change of just the enhancer that's nearest to each gene along the linear genome. And actually what we saw is when we add this term, it does not show a strong positive correlation with, with gene expression, and it does not explain much more of the transcriptional variance in our data. And this is in contrast to when instead of the nearest enhancer, we add in the term of 
the looped enhancer acetylation pole change for each gene. This does show a much stronger positive correlation with gene expression and explains much more of the transcriptional variance that's held within our data. So we use this data to um, suggest to us that loops do indeed matter for regulating activity responsive gene expression. And at that point, uh, we focused on distinguishing between these two looping hypotheses. And really, to do that, it was pretty simple. It just involved looking for the presence of these dynamic loops within our 5C regions, within our 5C uh, analysis data. And we did this using a, a computational package developed in the lab by two fellow grad students, uh, Thomas Gilgas and Lindsay Fernandez, that identifies dynamic looping events in an FDR-controlled manner by changes in loop strength across conditions. And actually what we found was that a, a small but notable proportion of the loops we identified, actually about 10% of those identified, did not exist in the repressed activity state and were de novo induced upon neuronal activation. Uh, and, and oftentimes these, these dynamic loops, these activity induced loops connected those activity induced enhancers uh, via these loops to specific target genes that were upregulated, oftentimes IEGs. And one example of that, again, is this FOS gene that I mentioned previously, where specifically in active neurons, the FOS gene on the x-axis here loops upstream to this activity-induced enhancer region. And we believe drives the upregulation of, of the FOS gene. And so in a more quantitative approach, rather than just looking at specific examples, we can lump all of those genes together that form this set of dynamic loops and look at their expression profiles. And again, I'll remind you, this is just a subset of the genome, but even within our, our selected subset, th these dynamic loops were relatively, relatively rare, but the genes at their base were all highly upregulated in active neurons compared to inactive neurons. And so we classify these loops as rare, but with a strong correlation uh, towards transcriptional upregulation in active neurons. And again, this is in contrast to those poised loops, those invariant loops across activity states that connect activity-induced enhancers to target genes, which were much more common, but the genes at the base of these loops were only modestly upregulated in active neurons compared to inactive neurons. And finally, as sort of a negative control, we included those loops where at their base are enhancers whose activity actually goes in the opposite direction. They, their enhancer activity goes down in active neurons. Um, and as you might expect, the genes at the base of these loops, uh, their expression also goes down in active neurons. And so we concluded from this data that both dynamic and poised loops regulate the activity response gene expression, although in different abundancies and degrees. And, and at this point, we return to our question of whether different long-range epigenetic mechanisms regulated those rapidly expressed IEGs compared to the slowly expressed SRGs. And we had already seen that these dynamic loops, this first class of loops here, um, connected the IEG FOS to a nearby activity-induced enhancer. So we asked whether those, these similar dynamic loops regulate the expression of an SRG like BDNF. And indeed, um, we do observe uh, similar dynamic loops formed by the BDNF gene. So here's BDNF on the x-axis. And it's looping upstream, again, specifically in activity-induced neurons to this set of activity-induced enhancers. Um, but visually, it was, it was instantly clear that BDNF actually had a very different overall looping structure than FOSS. Um, and you can see here on the left, this, this specific loop is actually a zoom-in of this very complex looping structure that BDNF forms across this roughly three megabase topologically associating domain. And we were really blown away by how complex this looping structure is, especially in comparison to that relatively simplistic looping structure that FOSS exhibited. And so ultimately, the, the lesson here that we learned from this initial 5C data set was that um, the immediate early gene FOSS engaged in, in very simple singular loops to a very few small number of enhancer targets, whereas BDNF engaged in a complex network of very long range loops connecting to many different distal activity-dependent enhancers. And given that we know genes like FOSS are actively, activated rapidly, whereas secondary response genes such as BDNF are expressed much later, our leading hypothesis is that 
looping complexity is linked to timing. So we hypothesize that these immediate early genes in general, like FOSNARC, form simple short-range singular loops, and this helps the gene get activated quickly, whereas secondary response genes form multiple intertangled, much longer range network of loops connecting to many enhancers, and this is uh, connected to their delayed expression profile. And although I don't have time to discuss all the details, I, I will direct you to our upcoming manuscript, where we do find that these trends seem to hold true across genome-wide IEGs and SRGs in general. That SRGs form more loops, longer loops, and interact with, with more enhancers. And at this point, I'll just point out, um, because we're in the process of profiling these IEG loops genome-wide, um, because they're very short range, we need that high resolution genome folding mapping technology, um, like the REM high C maps that we've seen in the previous presentations, to identify such short range uh, dynamic looping interactions. But uh, this work did not answer our, one of our initial questions as to whether these longer SRG loops also display delayed formation kinetics. Uh, to do this, to answer this question, we mapped genome folding, enhancer activity, and gene expression across an acute time scale of neuronal activation. So here I'm showing again the FOS gene, the same heat map I showed before, um, gene expression of, of the FOS gene, and then also enhancer activity of these two different activity-induced enhancers. And here we're looking at zero minutes of neuronal activity or inactive neurons. And again, we see the gene is off, the enhancer is off, and no loop has formed. This remains true after uh, five minutes of neuronal activity, but by just 20 minutes of induced neuronal activity, and really this kind of blew our minds, um, we see this loop form very strongly. This enhancer is, is on, it's very active, and the gene has begun to be turned on. But it's not until 60 minutes of neuronal activation um, that we see the gene is, is fully expressed, uh, and the loop remains strong, and, and again, the enhancer uh, remains active. And finally, by six hours of sustained neuronal activation, the gene has begun to be turned off, the enhancer is inactive, and the loop, some signature remains, but is basically disconnected. And, and it, so this was really striking to us that this loop could form so rapidly, and in fact, uh, the loop formation precedes peak mRNA levels. And, and as we're beginning to dissect or do causal experiments, we're still dissecting the regulatory role of these loops, but this to us was an initial indication that this loop is in fact deriving the expression of the FOSS gene. And we can compare this, this FOSS dynamic looping to the looping kinetics at BDNF, that SRG that I've been discussing. So at, at BDNF, like FOSS, there's no looping structure at this dynamic looping heat map uh, in inactive neurons or at zero minutes of neuronal activity. Uh, and this remains true like at FOSS at, at the five minute time point. But really this remains true through the first hour of neuronal activity. And we don't start to see looping signature at this site until six hours of sustained activation, at which point the gene has also begun to be turned on. And we don't see maximum loop strength and maximum gene expression until that 24 hour time point, a full day of, of sustained neuronal activation. And so obviously this is different than that FOSS locus that I showed previously, where this is much slower uh, loop formation kinetics that's much more tightly correlated with the exp uh, gene expression timing, and loop formation does not actually precede the maximum mRNA levels of this gene here. And so in, in summary, what I've shown you today is that um, greater than 10% of the loops we identify within our 5C regions actually are induced de novo upon the activation of cortical neurons, um, that these activity-inducible enhancers engage in those poise loops and also those, those dynamic or de novo loops that connect these enhancers to genes that respectively are modestly and very uh, dynamically upregulated in response to neuronal activity. Also, that immediate early genes like FOSS and ARC connect to target enhancers via very short-range, simple looping structures, compared to secondary response genes like BDNF, which engage in a much more complex network, long-range activity invariant and activity-inducible loops uh, with much slower 
information candidates. And just before I wrap up, I'd just like to introduce some of the, the future directions um, we're taking this work. And as I mentioned, we're, we're now beginning causal experiments to dissect the regulatory role of these enhancers and loops. And so that involves both using CRISPR-based technologies to disrupt these enhancers and loops, as well as using loop engineering techniques like LADL, which was developed in, in our lab recently, um, to induce formation of these loops in activity states when perhaps these loops or enhancers do not usually uh, exist or are not usually active to map their regulatory potential in, in expression of these target genes like POS. Uh, and finally, we're beginning to use our activity dynamic enhancer sets to map their preferential locations at loop anchors with neuropsychiatric disease associated genetic variants thereby mapping target genes that may exhibit activity dynamic expression patterns and make predictions about the activity states in which genetic variants may disrupt expression. Uh, and, and with that, I just, uh, again, want to um, acknowledge my amazing mentor, Jen, who wishes she could have been here uh, to give this talk herself, um, and our awesome uh, collaborators at the University of Utah, Dr. Shepard and his postdoc, Dr. Pastuzan, my co-authors here highlighted in purple and all of the members of the Kremens Lab team, as well as our funding agencies. And with that, I'd be happy to take any questions. All right, thank you very much, uh, John. Um, we have a question here um, from Gianni. Uh, I think I have this question as well. Um, and the, that question is, for a neural activity response gene, if you have multiple loops, then how do you decide which loop to use for your gene expression association analysis? Yeah, um, great question. So we, we um, thought a lot about that and actually tried a few different, um, different approaches. And the one that worked best was actually a slight adaptation of the, the ABC model um, that was recently published um, out of Jessane Gretz's group uh, in Nature Genetics. Um, and so that's basically multiplying enhancer activity by looping strength to get a prediction of the enhancers that matter most to regulate each gene. Um, and so we made slight adaptations to that. We used thresholded loops rather than just high C contact frequency in general. Um, but for each gene, it was always the enhancer with that highest loop strength times enhancer activity score um, that we paired and a given enhancer to, to a specific gene. Got it, okay, yep, um, that makes sense. Uh, I was also wondering, um, you know, I think one of the things that you wonder when you, um, you have a locus like this for, let's say the SRG, the secondary response genes, when you see contacts between a promoter and multiple enhancers, you know, I think the word network sometimes implies that it's a, a co-association or a hub of interactions, but do you have any idea of whether those are just pairwise interactions and heterogeneity across cells, or are they forming actual hubs of one promoter and multiple enhancers? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. And, and you make a great point that um, because, so I didn't stress this really, but at this point, these are just whole cortices that have been dissociated and, and plated in vitro and then manipulate their activity manipulated with um, drugs. And, and so we do have a, a heterogeneous cell population. And so um, we do believe some of these loops and enhancers may be cell type specific and we're picking up an ensemble of loop signature across, across the cell population. Um, and, and so many of them may be, you know, present in this subpopulation, but not, not another. Um, so many of them may be cell type specific. Um, I, I don't have a, a good answer for you on in terms of if m multiple loops are present in a given cell, are they hubs? Um, we haven't tested that. And I think that's a, a really interesting question. And, and one way, one future direction that we've discussed um, getting around these questions is using like an oligo storm or a, like an orca approach to actually um, image some of these tads and loops within single neurons within a, a neural population as we um, manipulate their activity. And if we could correlate, um, you know, single cell 
uh, folding imaging in that way with activation of specific neurons, we could maybe start begin to answer some of these questions. Okay, thank you. Um, let's see if we have any. Um, okay, one other one other question here is um, I think you mentioned something, John, about um, broadening the analysis of these early um, early genes and secondary genes to a genome-wide scale. Could you comment more on uh, that and any findings from that genome-wide survey and how it relates to what you presented here? Yeah, um, so we haven't necessarily done um, genome-wide analyses across activity states, but we could look at um, genome-wide uh, looping signatures of just uh, actually inactive neurons. And so we're, we're more looking at those, those poise loops, those invariant loops, and, and the formation of um, those loops by those different gene classes. And so um, using that inactive neuron high c data set, we could then um, classify or quantify how many loops each SRG formed, how many loops each IEG formed, and, and then compare the two. Um, and so like I mentioned in my talk, um, when we do that, that global analysis across the genome, we do overall see that SRGs in general form more loops, form longer loops, and interact with more enhancers than um, IEGs. And uh, I, I will say um, we were leveraging, to classify IEGs versus SRGs, we're leveraging a data set from uh, the lab of, of Jesse Gray, and they actually take it a step further to um, classify SRGs or, or delayed response genes in their case based on translational dependence versus independence um, or the dependence of new, uh, translation of new proteins to drive the expression of these delayed response genes. And so what we actually see is that um, those genes that are not dependent on novel protein translation to be upregulated in response to, to neuronal activity, that those are the genes with this really dramatically increase um, looping signature and uh, longer loops, more loops, that, that more loop complexity signature that I, that I mentioned. Um, and so we really do it's, believe it's a specific epigenetic state linked to this class of genes that uh, display this delayed expression profile in response to neuronal activity. All right, one more, one more technical question uh, here. I guess I was also wondering a similar thing is, um, I think for some of these looping analyses with the 5C data, and maybe this also translates to high C data, is what, what type of resolution or bin size do you think you have to analyze the data in to observe what you did here in your own study? Yeah, um, so, uh, this was actually our first study in the lab where we used um, an updated 5C approach, um, which uh, called a, the double alternating 5C approach, which has uh, 5C primers designed to both ends of each restriction fragment. Um, but we still use Hindi 3 as our restriction enzyme, so we're kind of limited by um, how big those restriction fragments are. So we tend to, to bin our data at 4 to 5 KB, um, depending on, on the regions we're looking at. Um, and, and because just of uh, the size of the restriction fragments um, that we're working with, that's kind of the, the limit of our resolution. But if you go to say, you know, a, a four cutter or a, a really high resolution uh, cocktail of restriction enzymes, like, like the Arima cocktail, um, you can obviously improve that resolution. You just have to, in the 5C approach, design more primers because you have more restriction fragments and you're designing primers to each fragment. And so that drives the cost, your initial cost up. Um, so, you know, it's a, it's a give and take there. Um, hopefully that answered your question. Yeah, yeah that, yeah, that does. Okay, well, thank you very much, uh, John. Um, great, I'll stop. Uh, really great presentation, great, great discussion on the questions, and I'll hand it back over to Joe to introduce the next speaker. Great, thanks very much.